Uh, my name is Raphael Bostic. I'm the uh, professor in the Saul Price School of Public Policy, and I'm the director of the Bedrosian Center uh, for Governance and the Public Enterprise. And I want to welcome everyone here for um, what should be an interesting hour or so, uh, where we talk about identity politics. Uh, we've, we've asked two candidates uh, who are on the roster for, uh, I guess, the elections in a little more than a month. A little less than a month um, for the city council. Uh, and we thought it would be interesting to, to talk about uh, these candidates and the candidacy and, and running for office um, in the context of identity and the role that identity plays uh, in uh, people's decisions to run and how it shapes how they run and the types of things that they talk about. Uh, and so um, I'm really excited that we were able to put this panel together and I want to thank our, our panelists for, for being here. This event is uh, a joint event and it's run, uh, co-sponsored by my center, which is the Bedrosian Center, uh, also with the Political Student Assembly, and you just heard from them, they're having an event next week, uh, the Latino, Latina Student Assembly, and the LGBT Resource Center. Um, and I wanna thank all of them for uh, agreeing to work with us. It's not something that we've done before, but I'm hopeful it's something that we do a whole lot more in the future. So, um, so everyone should keep an eye out for that. Um, I want to uh, invite, our, I want to introduce our panelists. Um, you'll, I say panelists in the plural, but we only have one here presently. Uh, the other one is uh, in transit, uh, and we'll hopefully get here uh, soon. So we're going to start, and I will start by talking about Ana Cubas. Um, Anna is a candidate for Los Angeles uh, City Council District 9, and she has a, a tremendous um, experience and uh, a lot of background, uh, which varies in terms of how she's done public policy. She's worked in Washington at the Department of Education. She's worked in Sacramento at the Legislative Analyst Office. She's worked in the city in the Le Legislative Analyst Office and has also worked for the city council uh, president at the time, Alex Vadia, as well as having been an appointee under both um, mayors Han and Villaraigosa. So she's seen it all, federal, state, uh, city, legislative, and executive. It's the only thing you haven't been as a judge, so uh, <laughs> we'll have to see if we can work on that. In the future. <laughs> um, but, um, but I wanted to just start by um, by, by first welcoming you, and please welcome uh, candidate Kubas. And I wanted to, to start uh, by talking about a, a fact that I thought was really interesting, which is that we haven't had a Latina on the city council in 20 years. Um, and you know, why do you think that is? And, and what, what's the dynamic that, that has helped to drive that? Well, thank you so much for the invitation. I wanted to tell you the Ninth <coughs> Council District is very important to you as USC students and USC faculty and USC staff because you are in the Ninth Council District. So the elected official who represents the Ninth has a direct impact on USC and its surrounding community. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being informed. And I will say that if you are a student on campus, I encourage you to register to vote and vote on March 5th. We have an election that is unprecedented because we have half of the city council termed out. So we have what's called open seat. So your current councilwoman is Jan Perry. She's termed out, she served 12 years. And now you all have an opportunity to elect your new representative basically for the next 12 years. So it will have a huge impact on USC and the surrounding community. So I'm very proud to be here. And again, I wanna share with you how important this election is to you. Now, identity, identity and identity politics. I was thinking about this on my way here. And certainly my identity is I'm a woman, right? First and foremost, I am a Latina by ethnicity and racial background and an immigrant in terms of my status and how I came to this country. Uh, and the other I would say is low income, poor. So you have these factors that I believe uh, have played a role in why we have not had a Latina 
council member since Gloria Molina, and she served, I believe, until 1991. Uh, what's interesting, too, about LA City Council is there's, as many of you know, 15 members. Out of the 15, there's only one woman, and that's Jan Perry. And I just explained to you that she's termed out. She served her 12 years. All of my opponents are men, nothing against men. Uh, but there's a scenario uh, where if I'm not elected, we may have an all-male city council, which I think is, for the city of LA, quite tragic and backwards because that probably hasn't happened since uh, the 1940s and the 1950s. Uh, Roz Wyman was the first woman elected to the city council. She represented the west side. Uh, and so the factors that I think have led to the lack of women on the city council and certainly the lack of Latina women is uh, number one, the barriers. I call it barriers to entry. There are not a lot of high level women or Latina women at city hall. So one of the ways that you'll notice that you become a council member, a pathway to being a council member, obviously is you have the leadership skills, but number two is knowing the system, right? And for me, what made me unafraid to launch my candidacy is I knew the system. I have been most recently a chief of staff to council member Jose Wizar, and when you're chief of staff, you manage the entire office. I manage the staff of 22. I manage all of the issues that the council member dealt with, the field issues, the constituent issues, the policy issue, the politics, his reelection. So I basically helped him uh, manage the office, manage himself. And you'll notice there's not that many women chiefs of staff in City Hall. There's probably three of, there were three of us when I was there. Three of 15. Mm -hmm. of, so each council member, of course, has a chief of staff. And I also think about when I first started working in City Hall, which was in 1998, there were five women on the city council, five or six, I believe. There was Ruth Galanter, uh, Laura Chick, Rita Walters, Cindy Misikowski, Janice Hahn, and I'm leaving someone out. But what I do know is that the, the people who replaced them on the city council were men. And I've made a pledge, because I've been endorsed by a lot of the women's groups, Women's Political Committee, the National Women's Political Caucus. My pledge to that group, those groups have been that if elected or when elected, I should say, I will groom and train a woman to replace me. Uh, and I will create a women's caucus within city council to groom and train and promote and help women become chiefs of staff, become city commissioners, have the opportunities that I had uh, within city hall, within the system, because... So, so now you said something actually interesting, which is we were doing a whole lot better 12, 15 years ago than we are now. Mm -hmm. What's changed? I mean, have, have, was there, I mean, I mean um, you're not an L.A. historian, so this may be putting a burden no, on you. No, that's okay. But, I love L.A. city history. But, but, but was it the case that the folks on the council in the 80s were more purposeful in trying to build that pipeline? Or, or are there things that we've just taken for granted? Uh, where, where, have we, where have we stepped back? I mean, do, if you have thoughts on that. I do, I do think there was a concerted effort back then to create opportunities for women to run for city council, to groom them, to finance them. Uh, running for city council is no easy task. You have to raise anywhere between $300,000 to $500,000 to be a council member. And did you know that as a female candidate, usually people, a donor, will write to you as a woman a less amount than to a man, a male candidate. So if a, a donor, let's say I'm at a fundraiser, and there are donors, whether they be men or women, they'll give me $100, but to a man, they'll give 500 or 700. So it's part of that gender politics and frankly sexism that I think has prevented many women from going into this arena. 
if you look at the other open seats, even um, Matt Zabo's seat, and I've known Matt for 12 years actually, he and I grew up together in City Hall. He definitely knows City Hall as much as I do. I really like him, I support him. Uh, but in his seat, which I believe is 20 candidates that filed, not a single woman. In Council District 1, not a single woman filed to run. And so there's something wrong, right? Now at the state legislature and in Congress, you have the women's caucus, you also have the Latino caucus, the African American caucus, they raise money to run their candidates. LA City Hall has never had that. And that's why one of my pledges is to create that. Now I'm lucky, remember I, I've been within the system for a long time, and I know how to fundraise. I've seen my bosses fundraise. I used to go to the fundraisers with them. I know how to ask for money. And you have to be, you know, asking a lot. In fact, today since 9 a.m. until I got here, I was at my fundraiser's office dialing for dollars. <laughs> I have some fundraisers coming up. So I've raised, I think we're pretty close to 250000 uh, And our goal is, is 300000 So we're close to the March 5th. I'm very lucky too that I was mentored and promoted to be chief of staff by council member Jose Wizar. For some of you who picked up my, um, my walk piece, and this is what we mail voters, uh, you'll see his photo in the back. Uh, also, I've been endorsed by councilwoman Rita Walters. She represented the area before Jan Perry did. Um, and it takes those types of endorsements to make any candidate, especially a female candidate, viable. So let me ask you uh, uh, an interesting question. Well, at least I think it's interesting. Um, you, when you started talking, you said you were, you had four identities. You had an identity as a woman, as a Latina, as an immigrant, and as a low-income person. Mm -hmm. oh, we've talked a lot about <coughs> the, um, the gender aspect of identity. Is that the biggest one, do you think? Or, or, or one of the other ones at least is as challenging uh, in the context of thinking about the, the process? Uh, I believe that as I've gone up in my professional career, gender has been the biggest issue. In the beginning, when my family and I first started out, it was the fact that we were immigrants, that I came to this country at the age of 10 I remember my first day of school and my knees were shaking so hard I didn't speak English. This was my first time in the United States, so that was pretty scary. I remember my dad was a day laborer. He used to stand in corners begging for work. You know, he's the type of guy that you see at Home Depot. He actually used to stand in front of this paint store called Sherwin-Williams, some of you may remember it, and he picked up the trade of being a house painter. Uh, and fast forward 20 years later, uh, 30 years later, he now ha has his own contracting license to paint houses. So poverty and my immigrant status was, I think, a block. And fundamentally, why I'm running is because I remember, well, well why, what helped me? How did I succeed? How did I end up going to UC Berkeley? And I have my master's from Princeton. What helped me? And I remember three things. My local library, where my sister and I used to go after school, it was safe, it was clean. My mom and dad had multiple jobs. They were not at home when we were at home. We would have been latchkey kids watching TV, wasting our time. But my mom was smart enough. She took out a library card for each one of us. I had my card, my sister had her library card. And she told us, go to the library, wait for me there, come home at 6.30, the local park, when I was in middle school, I enrolled in drill team and dance team. I used to go to competitions at Disneyland and Magic Mountain. That was provided by the city. I only had to raise money for my uniform and my shoes, and we sold those chocolate bars with the almonds to, to raise money for, you know, I'm mm -hmm. sure some of you remember that. And I remember in high school, too, my history teacher, this white guy, liberal guy, he was a hippie. He went to Berkeley in the 60s. He was the one that sat me down and said to me, Anna, you're a bright student. I want you to apply to Berkeley. I want you to go to college. He showed me the catalog of classes at Berkeley back then. There were thick catalogs. I know everything now is all online. That's how you sign up for your coursework. And I thought, sure, why not? I'd never been to Berkeley. 
never heard of it. Uh, none of my family had gone to Berkeley. And those are the things that I remember made a huge impact in my life. And that's why, why I'm running for office fundamentally, because I would like to make sure that those opportunities, those resources, are available to the children and families of the 9th District. Let's be honest. USC and the 9th District, we live in dichotomies, right? We have a lot of wealth. We have LA Live, Staples Center. We have the Convention Center. We have USC and the Coliseum. But as many of you know, there are many areas, many neighborhoods in the 9th District that are very challenged, very poor, very immigrant. And I do believe that because of my experience, because of my immigrant experience, because I'm a woman, because of my education, I am the most qualified to represent the 9th Council District. So um, for those of you who weren't with us last week, we actually had a a session uh, on exactly uh, what uh, Ms. Kubis was talking about, which is the relationship between USC and the surrounding neighborhoods. We called it social justice. Um, you should check out our website and see that video. It's actually quite an interesting discussion if you haven't seen it. Um, I get to do commercials too, so. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, um, I, w I wanted to ask a, a bit about um, what, you, what you just said, which is um, the role of identity in shaping how you view your candidacy. Uh, how much of this identity stuff shows up in your materials? How much was of it is something that you call and draw upon in trying to um, signal your connections to, to your, your potential constituents? Well, I walk every day, so my schedule is in the mornings I fundraise. In the afternoons from 4 to 8, I walk door to door. and. Many of the people that open the door are Spanish speakers, and I'm able to speak Spanish to them. Uh, many of them are women, so I'm able to connect. So of course, I use my identity and who I am to connect with the voters. Uh, many African-American women are actually very supportive of me because even though our racial race and ethnicity is different, they connect with me as a woman especially when I talk about how there's a lack of women on the city council. And uh, so yes, I use my identity to connect with people, to tell them my story, and to fundamentally let them know that I will fight hard for them. I will work hard every day, tirelessly, to make sure that our council district has the resources that we need. And here's a simple fact, and this is when you work within the system, you understand this clearly. There's clarity. The LA City budget is a seven billion dollar budget. It is bigger than mo it is a bigger budget, biggest bigger resource than most countries. Okay, we're the second largest city in the nation. We have we're the entertainment capital of the world. There is no reason why some of our neighborhoods should have la a lack of resources. For me, it's about leadership. It's about leadership, it's about fighting, and I have the ability to tell whatever department, Rec and Parks, Bureau of Sanitation, the police department, those are the departments that are part of the city, if they tell me, well, Miss Cubas, Councilwoman Cubas, there's not enough money in our budget for that. You're asking for too much. I will be able to tell them, you know what, I, I know your budget well. These are the line items in your budget. I know that you're not telling me the whole truth, so work with me, help me out. Because we deserve the same level of resources that other districts have. So um, I want to turn to questions from the audience in a second, but I had just two, two other questions. Um, um, you know, this isn't a campaign event. Right. This is, uh, we're, we're on campus, we're trying to do things for students to give them some insights as to what they might think about doing in the future. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to know if you had thoughts for, for students as they think about their future courses as to what sorts of things would you recommend them to do if they were interested in engaging in the policy process or mm -hmm. working in the city or going to the state? What, what kind of things uh, would you say would be important to do? Mm -hmm. I, 
I know when I was a student, obviously I was involved in a lot of student groups. Um, and just so you know, we created, uh, thanks to my good friend David over there, a uh, USC Trojans for Ana Cuba's Facebook page. So please go on it and like it. One of the things that my campaign is very good at is social media. Um, but I remember as an undergrad uh, being uh, very hungry for information about programs or internships or things that would help me. And there's a lot of, gr if you're interested in public policy, which was always my interest, that was always what I thought I'd wanted to do. Uh, there's fellowships, there's internships, there's programs. So get that information. Luckily, the internet it has a wealth of it. Uh, also, if you'd like to intern at City Hall, many council members would love to have you as an intern. Many offices cannot pay, but the experience you get there is priceless because you do do a lot of work. Um, and so when I was an undergrad, I applied for this program called the Woodrow Wilson Fellows Program. And it's a competitive program. I applied, I got in. It's basically uh, for students of color who are interested in going into public policy. And you spend a summer uh, a, a doing a public policy program. You take econ, you take stats, you take poli sci. And if you complete the program and you do well, they guarantee a full fellowship to a graduate school. I know USC honors that fellowship. In fact, I did apply for the public policy program here at USC. I got admitted to Princeton, <laughs> so I chose to go to Princeton to the Woodrow Wilson School. We, we can talk about that. Yeah, later. sorry <laughs> about that. Uh, uh, because I wanted the East Coast experience. Um, and, and Princeton uh, was kind enough to pay my full two years of being their tuition and housing. So luckily I didn't have debt. Uh, so when I graduated, I could go work immediately into government and the public sector. I didn't have to make as much money, I think. Um, but that's part of the sacrifice. I believe that if you're a student, if you're interested in politics, if you're interested in public policy, one of the things you have to think about is you're not necessarily going to make a whole lot of money, but if your life mission is to make a difference, to help the community, for me, that's the value. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I had to give up my job as chief of staff to run full time on my campaign, and that's a huge sacrifice. Uh, but I believe in, in what I'm doing. I believe that we need change in the 9th District. And luckily, I have the skill set to actually run a good campaign and be a viable candidate. Uh, but that's something to think about. Uh, and certainly as an undergrad or grad student, just be clear about what makes you happy, what you want out of life. You know now, there's no mystery to it. It's what puts a smile on your face, what makes you happy. So follow that dream, follow that goal, and the money will come, the opportunities will come. So just two things on, on that. Uh, I would uh, uh, completely agree with what you said about following what you like. Um, I would as add one word, which is passion. Mm -hmm. So things that you get passionate about, um, get to know them well and figure out if there's something you can do long run. Um, and I, I do that, be I say passion because a lot of the, the things that you have to do, not sexy, mm -hmm. not a lot of fun, not super interesting all the time. Uh, but if you can get through those things, then you get to the really great stuff. And mm -hmm. when you have passion, you're willing to just plow through and get that, thing, that stuff yep. done. Uh, and then the second thing I really appreciated your comment on was the degree of sacrifice. Um, doing public service is a tremendous sacrifice. And everyone who does it, regardless of what you see on the headlines and all that sort of stuff, they've made significant choices to sacrifice in their life on behalf of the, the public. Uh, and that's something that uh, should not be underestimated. And, and it's really mm -hmm. incredibly admirable um, to, uh, to see you do that, and in fact, to see everyone who goes into public service do those things. So thank you for that as well. Mm -hmm. All right, the last question, and then we'll, we'll go out um, to, uh, to, to audience questions. Um, so down the hall from my center in Lewis Hall is a center that uh, was established by a former governor. Uh, mm -hmm. There's the Schwarzenegger Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of their um, 
their tenets is the notion of post-partisanship, which is the idea that um, you know the parties, they're out there fighting, they just fight to fight, and there's not a lot of useful stuff happening there, and that we need to get to a place where you know, we're not about parties anymore, we're just about policies, and we can just do that. Um, do you think that, that there will ever be a time when we can get to post-identity in the context of, of our policy space? Or is there something sort of latent in humanity that means that identity will always play a role and that we have to figure out how, how to manage that? Well, in my campaign, I have made it a point for my team to be diverse. Uh, that's why I'm so honored, too, to have the support of Rita Walters because she's an African-American. So the identity of black and brown is something that is playing out in my campaign. And my goal is to unify our communities to fight for the issues because we are all neglected by City Hall the same. Our, and, and frankly, when I go door to door, there's just basic fundamental issues about clean streets, clean alleys, and whether you're in a black or brown household or neighborhood, it's the same issue. So my campaign is a coalition campaign and we focus on the issues. Um, the city of LA, as you know, municipal elections are nonpartisan, so the whole party politic doesn't play a role, but certainly there is the gender element and the racial ethnic element. And this is something that I will say that as a woman, I do believe that women and I have a better ability to bring people together uh, because when I go to someone's door, they see me, I'm a woman, I'm not a threat to them. They're more open to talking to me. Um, so I do believe that that helps in the way that women deal with crises and situations. We are much better about collaboration bringing people to the table and working things out. Uh, and that's why I really believe that I've seen that play out and I really hope and wish that more women would run for local office, whether it's school board, community college board, LA City Council, because those uh, places create the pipeline for state assembly, for state senate, for Congress. And if we are not grooming and training women to run for office, then we're gonna basically lose that pipeline and in a few years you will see fewer state assembly members that are women, fewer state senators, and then in turn fewer congress people, fewer U.S. senators. So you just sparked another thought in my head which is um, the, the group Emily's List. Mm -hmm. right? there, there are organizations out there that are oriented toward this. Do they happen at the local level, do you know? There are some that uh, look at local races. Emily's list tends to focus on the federal, the congressional. And the last November, they saw a record number of women entering Congress, which I think is great. But I, I just think the city of LA is behind the ball here. We need to do something, it's a crisis. And for me, that's why there's no option but to win because that is an issue I have to and I will tackle my first 100 day in office. All right, well thank you. Let me turn to you, the audience. Uh, are there questions for Ms. Kubis that you'd like to ask, if you have any? Um, yes. Thank you, first off, Ms. Kubis, for, for joining us. I really appreciate your perspective and what you bring to the table. Um, my name is Justin. I'm a public policy master's candidate currently. And um, I'm very interested in identity politics. My background is actually in ethnic studies. So my question is if and when um, you get elected to city council as being like the only woman as well as a woman of color, do you think there's a role that um, unpacking privilege plays in your time serving as a city council member, um, particularly within like the meetings that you might have and what might that look like? Well, inevitably, I would focus on issues or legislation that impact children and women and low-income folks, uh, whether African-American or Latino. My family has lived in the district for over 20 years. I live on 40th and Broadway near here. And I, 
it, it's just part of my thinking anyway that I would focus on those issues. And I believe it's done in a way that is non-threatening to the powers that be because what you do is when you have the community, when you have the support of the groups in your district, you're able to be more powerful. You're able to be, uh, to have more impact than you would otherwise. Uh, and so that's, that's what I'm counting on, is having the support of the community to help me usher whatever changes or reforms or legislation or programs I need to take on to make sure that, that the ninth is, uh, has the resources that are needed to, to make sure it's a, a thriving district with good jobs, with good schools, with great parks, and with good city services. Thank you. And uh, we have been joined by our other panelists. Welcome, Matt. Yeah. How are you? How are you? How are you? I, apologize. I apologize for arriving late. I had a snafu earlier today, so. It's all right. We've had a, a wonderful conversation with Anna. Okay. And, um, mm -hmm. And we were actually just turning to the questions in the audience. So I know there was one other I saw over here. Maybe we can do that, and then we can go and have a little chat with you on, sure. uh, on, the, on the topic. So there's a question over here. It wasn't me, but I'll take it. <laughs> so obviously, it seems like as a woman, you feel like you know, we have a duty to, um, to try and help other women uh, get to the level that you're at. Um, what do you think that we can do to help like girls when they're younger feel like they have these opportunities to to go get through school to pursue a higher education get a master's degree because I feel like a lot of the times girls are kind of held back and, and told that you know you really just need to graduate high school and just be a family person a lot of I know a lot especially in lower income areas they're stuck helping raise their siblings or something like that. So is there, do you think there's anything we can do to kind of help push girls to, to that level where they get to where we are, where you're obviously doing great things and like I'm a policy student as well. So that's kind of my goal too. So. Good. Uh, it begins with mentoring, telling even young girls uh, that what they could be, their full potential, a doctor, a lawyer, the US president. I'll tell you a story briefly about my own experience. So. I told you that I was accepted to Berkeley because of this teacher. My mom actually did not want me to go to Berkeley. She was dead set against me, against it. She wanted me to stay at home and go to UCLA or Cal State Northridge. I got accepted to both. But because I had it in my head that this teacher wanted me to go to Berkeley, and luckily by then I had turned 18, and I had to tell her, Mom, I'm an adult. I can do what I want, and I am going to Berkeley. And she, you know, she had no choice but to let me go, right? When someone, you have to rebel up. So one of the challenges is to help, especially Latino families, understand that it's okay to let your girls go away to college, that they're gonna be okay. Uh, obviously, my mom did it out of fear. She loved me, she's very proud of me. She was there at my graduation. But those are the things that we need to teach our families to, to, to just give them the information. And, and I think uh, we, we've got a long way to go, but those things still happen. They still happen. Well, thank you. Um, I want to now turn uh, to Matt. Um, Matt, like Anna, has a tremendously diverse background in terms of public service. Um, he has worked uh, with the former mayor, Richard Reardon, as a Council representative. He has been a legislative director to Councilwoman Wendy Gruel, who is running for mayor currently. Um, he's worked for the city attorney, and for the last three years, he has been a senior person in the Villaraigosa administration as a deputy mayor. Um, so he's seen it all as well uh, at the local level uh, legislative, executive, um, you too. Mm -hmm. We're just waiting for you to be a judge, and then we'll be all set. <laughs> um, and um, he recently stepped down from his position to uh, run for a spot uh, in the 13th Council, council District, uh, which encompasses as Hollywood. And you're openly gay. And um, looking through the roster of LA City Council people, there aren't a lot of them. Um, and so 
Um, I, I wanted to just start in terms of what role did identity play in, in your thinking about should you run, um, where should you run, and, and how, how that, what role that played in, in shaping your thoughts? Um, as it relates to my decision to run, I, I, I don't, at this, at this stage of where the city is and in, at this stage of, of my career and given the challenges that the city is faced, to be, to be honest with you, I think that what we're seeing is um, a real point of, of, of progress where um, I actually was literally just on the phone with Jackie Goldberg, who was the first openly lesbian uh, woman elected to the city council or any office in the city in, uh, in, in the city of Los Angeles and uh, it was a different time it was it, um, her being a, a lesbian woman was in and of itself a um, it was groundbreaking um, right now I think the issue is more that gays and lesbians are Part of the leadership structure. I mean, where it's 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 we've made such a, a an advance forward. I mean, the speaker of the uh, state assembly is um, an openly gay Latino, and uh, it was just I remember working for Reardon and, and work and and watching the debates in the state legislature, and back then the Latino caucus wasn't didn't want to get anywhere near any of the any gay right issues. And now we have an openly gay Latino who's the head of the state Who's assembly. The speaker, right? So it's um, the 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 pace of progress is um, is incredible uh, at right now for the LGBT community. Um, I would say though that it is um, not so much my decision to run, but my uh, beginnings into politics actually began as a student activist. Um, fighting for LGBT rights at the University of Notre Dame, where um, it was a, you know, obviously we're familiar with the University of Notre Dame here at SC. <laughs> it is a Catholic university. It is a very strongly Catholic university, and I come from a Catholic family. But I also believe that uh, you know, Catholicism teaches that you treat people equally and with respect. And the University of Notre Dame at the time that I was there uh, didn't allow gay kids to have uh, clubs on campus. Um, did not have any protections for gay and lesbian faculty or staff. And in fact, one of my professors was removed from the classroom when he came out. Um, uh, and I thought that wasn't right. I thought that didn't live up to um, any standards that should be at open at, at, a, at, a great pub, at a great university, much less a Catholic university that teaches, should teach equality and respect. So that was really my first foray into politics and taking on the administration and I worked with the college Democrats and we had a rally on the dome which I later found out was the first protest on the dome since Vietnam because it's just not a, it, Notre Dame is not a place that really cultivates student activism um, very well uh, people tend to kind of get in line but um, that's that's kind of how it started um, now, have you been surprised at the pace of change in, in terms of sexual orientation and gender identity as, as um, not being a barrier? Given that uh, five years ago, the state of California voted to ban gay marriage, yeah. I mean, we're gonna look, we'll look back at this period of 10 to 15, 20 years and it's just the, the, the pace of progress has been breakneck. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's really incredible um, how much progress we've made so quickly. Um, so I am surprised by it, but um, it's, also, it's also a great time to be in progressive politics, I'll tell you that. Now, some would say that, um, like, I, I've just been in Washington for the last bit, and there's been a whole lot of discussion about um, the gay lobby being uh, hyper powerful and super connected. Um, would you say that 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 sexual orientation is is an asset? I mean, is it something that you that you would uh, say gives people uh, an advantage in terms of identity politics? Would you go that far? Um, to the extent that 
Los Angeles. And the strength of Los Angeles, I think, is inherently is diversity. Um, having, being able to, I mean, coming from a background or coming to politics with an identity that has had challenges in its past, I think is something that, um, that people appreciate, whether they're gay and lesbian or of any other of our very many diverse communities. So I think, um, I think to that extent, but it's just, um, particularly this district, particularly the 13th district, Hollywood, East Hollywood, Silver Lake, um, uh, Echo Park. There's so much rich history there where, I mean, Silver Lake really became, um, you know, the whole Sunset Junction Music Festival that many of you may have been familiar with. It no longer exists, but um, it was a, this coalition of um, immigrants and actually uh, some the Latino gangs and the gay community in Silver Lake that got together and wanted to m improve their neighborhood and and they reached out and that's just that's kind of the the heart of that district and the richness of its history so um, I think it works where I'm running for sure now in terms of your your actual campaign um, how how do you in integrate sort of your identity um, as a as a gay man into your materials? Is it something that you thought much about, or is it just we're doing it? It's who I am. Let's go with it. Yeah. Well, I think the issue is it's it what I, the work that I've done on in on behalf of LGBT equality. I mean, even starting from like I said when I was a student, um, you know, it gives me the platform to speak about issues of equality for all communities and for immigrants and for low-income communities, for seniors that are on fixed incomes and in rent control housing and are concerned that they're going to lose their, their housing. Um, I mean, it's, it is a commitment to equality that I think is, be, extends beyond just the LGBT community. Um, but I'm much more comfortable, I think, fighting for it because I fought for it for myself. So I, I, I'm going to go back to questions in the audience in, in just a second. But I had um, um, two, two questions that I also uh, ended Anna's conversation with. The first is, um, you know, we're here. This is a campus event. Um, this isn't on the campaign trail, per se. Right. Uh, and I want to always try to make sure that, this, that we're thinking about things to provide guidance for the students. Um, if, so I wanted to get your thoughts on um, things that you might give as advice to students who are thinking about um, jumping into this arena, the policy space, mm -hmm. or the political space, as, as some early steps? Um, I, I'll tell you, I'll just be straight honest with you. It's a, very, it's a very basic thing, but it makes all the difference in the world. I was an intern when I was a grad student here. I was an intern in the mayor's office, and I was hired Three months later, uh, from being an intern to a full-time staffer, and then a very short period of time after that, I was doing regular policy briefings for the mayor of the city of Los Angeles, as best I could tell for one reason. Uh, I could write. I could write. That, the ability to write cons clearly and concisely, clearly and concisely, emphasis on concise, and convey a complicated idea in a relatively few words um, is absolutely a premium in being effective in government in the realm of public policy. So uh, any of the drills that you have, um, you know, the, the writing skills, and I, I was in a high school, I was at John Marshall High School yesterday and told the same thing to the high school kids in their AP class. It is absolutely the most critical skill that you can have in the, in the world of public policy. And, uh, and, that, and that was it, and that was it. I mean, I was writing things for the mayor as a 22-year-old when there were people who had 10 years of experience that uh, weren't allowed to do that. So, um, I, you know, just it's every, every bit of practice you have in that area is worth it. Well, thank you for that advertisement. Sure. I, I just added a class, an uh, assignment in my class, actually. I okay. decided I'm not doing long papers anymore, mm -hmm. no 20 page papers. Good. Everything is now a three page policy brief. Yes. yes. Right. That's and it. You got to yes. get it down to three pages because mm -hmm. the concise and clear language is actually mm -hmm. really important. That's 
that is exactly because no one's reading 20 pages. No. Mm -hmm. no, no, no. Actually, we're on film, so I can't even uh, lie if, <laughs> if your professors say, "What are you saying?" Um, but but yeah, so, so that's important. And then the second the second question had to do with the notion of um, the political space ever getting beyond identity, like being. So you hear people talk about post partisanship, mm -hmm. sort of getting outside of the party structure. Mm -hmm. um, is there any chance that we would ever get post-identity in terms of our politics? Or, or is there any chance, or an, is it a good thing? I think if we're talking about what a city does, um, I think that it offers the best opportunity. And I, I think that we can respect and acknowledge our uh, diverse identities because this is what makes Los Angeles one of the most special places in America, but um, people don't care at the end of the day uh, what color you are, religion you are, whether you're gay or lesbian, they want their pothole filled. And if you could, and, and that's, you know, when it relates to city services, it relates to keeping our neighborhoods safe, keeping our, our fire department able to respond uh, up, uh, in a, a appropriate time, having, you know, clean streets and uh, build potholes and building a transportation system and taking care of our environment. That's something that it, it extends beyond, you know, it, it extends across all cultures. And so I think as it relates to the city, we're not dealing with major uh, necessarily, although there are exceptions, major social policy. We're dealing with nuts and bolts poli politics. Mm -hmm. So. All right, well, thank okay. you. Um, I'll turn back to the, to the floor. Questions, yes. Uh, you mentioned that, um, you know, people don't want to, um, at the end of the day, people are not concerned about your, your color or your skin and, uh, you know, they're more concerned with the content of your character. Uh, well, you know, they don't even care about the content of your character mm -hmm. as much as they do about your word. Right. Your word means a lot of things to people here in South Los Angeles. And if you can perform what you say you can perform, uh, I've got your name. Um, I know this Kubis, I've never heard of her before. But I understand that you're openly gay. Don't nobody care. You know, really, all they really want to know, are you going to do the work that you say you're going to do? That's what they're talking about at the end of the day. You get in and whether you're gay or straight or purple, brown, uh, pink, whatever. They just want to know right now, are you going to do, because the people are sick and tired of politics of today and things that have been happening. So what do you plan on doing to change those things? Well, I'll tell, I'll tell you what, if, if there were two things, you asked me about what's the most important thing, and it's, it's writing, but I would say the, um, the second thing up there, right up with the ability to convey an idea on paper is, it is actually, and Anna can, I think, would agree with this, inside the realm of politics, it is actually a radical notion that you will keep your word 100% of the time, do what you say you're going to do, and never, and never go back on it. And if you give people your commitment, that commitment, you can take it to the bank. That is a rare quality. And, and, and part of the other reason I was able to advance so quickly is because, it, I mean, it seems like it's common sense, but it's actually, there are people um, have this tendency in, in a political realm to want to tell you what I think you want to hear and tell you what you think you want to hear and then kind of go back and do, do a lot of hand wringing and wonder and, and say, well, if I just tell them a little bit, they really won't know that my position is this. No. If you just are straight with people, and if you just tell them the truth as, as you know it, and you keep your word, over time you build the kind of trust that even, your, even if you disagree, people will, uh, will, will trust that you're going to be honest with them. And that's something that's absolutely critical, and, 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 and it's far too rare in politics today. Yeah, and we need more of that in politics, because I've seen what they have done to South LA, I've seen the people still struggling to meet their needs, everyday needs. I've lived here all my life. So I, I, I'm, you know, I, I came to see what, uh, what's going on to 
see what people are saying out here. I'm not politicking right now. I'm just saying that, you know, if we are going to do anything that's different, then we really need to take a look at what the people have been doing and saying and what they want out here. Not what you want, but what they want to accomplish in your tenancy. Because you are no longer a servant for yourself. You are a servant of the people. It's a public and you position. have to remember that. It's a very public position. Um, yes. yes. So are, are there any other questions? Other people? Yes. Um, I'm also a young Latina student leader, uh, and I often feel that if I submit my resume to an internship or my application to college, the first thing they see is Latina, last name's Hispanic, bilingual, she's accepted. So they're trying to promote the diversity. And uh, my skills or internships or experience kind of goes out the window. So how do you move past your identity as a Latina and push your skills to the forefront so people can see that rather than um, their own gain to diversify whatever they're trying to diversify? Well, as, as chief of staff where I had hired people and I saw many resumes, I would say your skills and your education have to be at the forefront. And as I mentioned before, the higher you go in the hierarchy of power and your professional career, the fewer women you will see, the fewer women of color you will see. And so obviously do whatever you can do to strengthen your skills, to get uh, a good education, to get certificates, to go to trainings, to go to seminars, and always continue building your skill set because once you're done with undergrad, I hope you go to graduate school or law school and continue your education. And once you have those degrees, continue to take classes to continue to build your skill set. So that would be my number one advice. And as was mentioned before, I've worked in Washington, D.C. I worked in Sacramento. I have worked at LAUSD. I worked in City Hall. and. Uh, I want to uh, emphasize what Matt said, your reputation, your word, your work product is everything. So once you're in a job, do it well, do the best that you can, build a good reputation, be straightforward and honest with people, and you will see yourself succeed. Because uh, I brought this up, Matt, I think you and I grew up in City Hall, right? We both started pretty young, uh, but we were able, because of our hard work, it, no, nothing was really handed to us. We had to earn when we kept moving up the, the, the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just keep working hard, keep building your skill set, and you'll see the opportunities come. Did you want to say anything on that? Matter? Well, I would just say that if, if someone, in, particularly in government, sees gives you an opportunity primarily because they see young Latina, I would take advantage of that because I'll tell you right now, even today at the top of the, at the upper echelon of city government, there is an astonishing lack of diversity and I think that it, I think that it hurts us. I really do. Um, even in the Villaraigosa administration, Antonio Villaraigosa, right, he came up through ACLU. When, if, if you look at the very top, the decision makers, and the people that make the decisions in the city so very often are, you have, you have the people at the top of the departments and then you have the people right underneath. And those are the key decision makers and there is an astonishing lack of diversity at that level. Mm -hmm. So I still think that it's, it's um, and I know by the way, having dealt with a, a incredibly difficult budget crisis, um, having the city literally um, teetering on the brink of financial disaster. I, I can tell you that having a diversity of thought um, in the toughest situations is a benefit because, I mean, I don't want to uh, stereotype my, you know, white male brothers, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's that when, you know, sometimes you do need to have, uh, I mean, I think just diversity of thought 
in more difficult situations is almost always going to lead to a better outcome, particularly in government when you're working, as you said, on behalf of the people, not behalf of individuals. Well, it can definitely lead to more creative solutions as ideas, a different set of ideas comes together um, and starts to grapple with each other, and that's interesting. The other, only other thing I would say is any opportunity you get, don't get stuck on the how or the why. Just mm -hmm. recognize it as an opportunity and make the most of it, and that's, that's true for everyone. So my last two jobs, I was the third choice, right? So not even the runner-up, right? Um, but once you get in there, all they care about is someone's doing the work. And if you do the work in a spectacular way, you become spectacular. And so, so do take advantage of those opportunities. Um, Bob, you had a question. I'm Bob Denbar, and I'm Director of Leadership Programs in the Price School. So interested in leadership. Uh, it occurred to me that the two of you have had wonderful opportunities to observe leadership, probably at its best and maybe at its worst. Um, I'm just curious what kinds of lessons you've drawn from your experience, and um, and also maybe what changes you've seen in terms of the styles of leadership that have been on display in the public sector in the last five, ten years. Well, I would say for me, um, being a leader means you are decisive and that you are able to get your team to move in a certain direction. And that's the experience I've had as chief of staff. That was my job to move the team in the direction that the elected official was, was uh, going towards. And I do believe that this is where my identity and my own experience plays a role because early on I had to be a leader in my family. So my family, most of them did not speak English. And once I spoke English, I was going to the doctor and translating for my mom and my siblings. And so early on, I had to take on that leadership role. And frankly, I became pretty fearless. And so the other factor of being a leader is being decisive and being fearless that you need to do what you need to do. You have faith in yourself. You have faith in your skill set and you have faith in God also because I, I do believe that we need to always continue to realize there's a higher power and a higher being that helps us along the way. And, and that's what I think of when I think of leadership. And I've been lucky that the elected officials I've worked for have those qualities that I was looking for and have been role models for me that in many instances they had to be fearless they were decisive they were able to move the team forward and my role was there to advise them to tell them the truth when no one else wanted to tell them the truth and to say you know what maybe we should do it this way give option a option b option c and then you have the leader choose whatever option and this is what I learned in public policy school too is don't always give one option in your policy memo there are many options right including the status quo is always an option um, she learned well that's ah good. yes <laughs> and so uh, and that's why I'm very uh, committed to empowering and training women to become fearless, become decisive, and take on those leadership roles because we need to groom that. We need to train more women to do that. Matt? Um, so I'm going to give a piece of advice that I think is um, probably might be the best lesson that I've learned, but it's also what I believe. And I think in addition to um, everything else that you learn, and everything else that, uh, that goes into making a good recommendation, uh, a public policy recommendation, or making a good decision as a leader, the most important thing that often, so very often is overlooked, is humility. And this is what I mean by that. You need to, the best decisions are made by those who are not afraid to admit what they don't know. Because if you admit to yourself what you don't know, and aren't afraid to admit to yourself what you don't know, you know exactly what questions you need to ask in order to find the right answer. And most often, you'll, it'll be self-evident who you need to ask. And most of the time that we, when you wonder and you see very bad decisions being made, most of the time it's because people's ego got in the way 
um, or if you look at what happens in Washington between Republicans and Democrats, it's mostly childish, mostly. And if they would just act like adults and be in the room, and you know, they could come to a lot better solutions a lot, a lot quicker and actually be doing the job that I think that we are electing them to do. Um, there is an inverse relationship, I think, between in, when, you're, in, when you're working in government, I think there's an inverse relationship between your, one's um, ego and their ability to solve big problems. Because you always, you never know everything, and you always need to be ready to learn and ready to ask questions, even at the highest level. And if I could just um, piggyback on that, um, the humility thing is important. No, knowing that you don't know something and being willing to say you don't know it is hugely important. And that's actually important for you as well, right? So you know, I've had, you know, where I've been the boss, ask staff, and you know, you can tell pretty quickly when they don't know, right? And if they say they don't know, but they're gonna go find out, I feel a whole lot better than when they start doing the song and dance and trying to make something mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. um, so that, Start that the, at the early part of your career. You, you will never, you will rarely, I can't say never, but you'll rarely get in big trouble for saying you don't know something, unless it's like really, really obvious. Um, you, you will definitely get in trouble if you say something that turns out not to be right or true, right? And, and so mm -hmm. don't, don't do those don't things. Don't guess. Yes, exactly <laughs> do right. Not Guessing guess. is dangerous. Do not guess. Um, and then the second thing is, I, I would add, is an ability to listen and really listen, right? So when there are other people in the room who are talking, really hear it, try to integrate it. Th those are important things. And humility and, and lack of ego is important for that. Um, and then the conciseness is the other piece because these guys are really busy. I right? say, so I have a half an hour to work through the issue. You gotta get to it really quickly and, and, and help on that point. Um, and with that in mind, um, I, we're, we have till 3.30, right? So I want to make sure that we have time to be in a less structured environment. So if you, if you all would please uh, join me in uh, thanking uh, our two uh, potential city council candidates for a really interesting conversation, I would very much appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.